Hi, this is Sarah Levis from Girl with the Cane, and this is the video post for A Downside to Closing Institutions. The movement to close institutions for people with intellectual disabilities has a downside. Michelle Bach, Executive Vice President of the Canadian Association for Community Living, told the Globe and Mail that housing is one of the largest issues for individuals with intellectual disabilities and their families. In Ontario alone, 12,000 people with intellectual disabilities are waiting for residential placements. Some have waited for decades as their parents have aged and become less and less able to care for them. Ontario put $1.7 billion in the last year into developmental services and residential placements. But the government throwing more and more money at the problem may not necessarily solve it, the Globe and Mail reported. And there's a link to the Globe and Mail article. I heart closing institutions. For the record, I'm totally in favor of closing the institutions. Not just because they've got a horrific history of abuse and rights violations for the residents, but because by their very nature they put up so many barriers to having the residents participate fully in the community. For example, when you've got 40 people in a building who want to go to church, doesn't it make more sense to bring in a priest to do a service? than to arrange the transportation, staff, etc. that would be required to get 40 people to a church service? I learned in school that it's cheaper for the government to operate community homes in towns and cities than it is to operate institutions. Where is the money going from completely closing Ontario's institutions? Some of it came with the people who left the institutions, of course. And from what I've seen in my community of the people who've come to live here as the institutions were closed, it was put to good use. But I think I assumed that closing the institutions would leave the sector with funding above and beyond what came with the individuals so that agencies could explore more community-based residential options. Not necessarily group homes, by the way. Other residential options have proven successful, even for people with disabilities that we'd have traditionally thought too severe to allow the person to have his or her needs met in a community setting, such as these Ontario programs. Assisted living, or living in a facility, but independently in a room or small apartment, but with whatever access to support the person and facility agree on. Enhanced supported independent living or living with roommates in a house or apartment with 24 hour access to staff. Supported independent living or living independently with mutually agreed upon check-ins with staff when support is needed. Or family share paying rent to live with a family that's agreed to assist with support needs. This is not a foster home environment. Like I said, I remember hoping that there would be more money for programs like these once the institutions closed. I also remember saying to someone as the closure dates for the last institutions got closer, I think it's a great thing, but I hope we're ready. I hope that there are enough resources to go around. Bring in some new ideas. I think that it's a great and necessary thing that the nonprofit sector is starting to develop ways of helping families to maximize their small amounts of government funding to develop housing arrangements and support arrangements in general. It represents a shift in how people with disabilities, their caregivers, and their support people 
defined, fund, and use supports that's long overdue. The journey may not always be comfortable and will definitely push us into uncharted territory, but we owe it to the 73% of working age adults with intellectual disabilities who are living in poverty and the parents well past retirement age who can no longer handle the needs of adult children with intellectual disabilities but must continue because there's no other choice to explore all the options. More about this next week when I review Donna Thompson's book, The Four Walls of My Freedom. And that's it for today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.